Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode, the fourth episode of this awesome experiment that we call Man Up. You're with uh, Greg, Mike, and Walt, my awesome co-hosts, and uh, we're in the sandbox here. What does that mean? We're foraying into a place we've never been, seeking to be honest, seeking to be vulnerable in the challenges of being a godly man. Those words are used often to the point of cliche. What does it mean? Are we living it? Are we going after it? Of course, we're all far from that mark, but this is a context to fix our eyes on that mark. If you go with us to um, Pentecost365.us, if you're there right now, you'll see the screen. And if you're listening by radio, we'll talk you through it. You don't need to be there, but if you do go to Pentecost365.us, you can see the past episodes. We've had some awesome guests in the past including Justin Fatika, a QB coach for the Saints, Joe Lombardi, our very first one, and then Pastor Bo talking about pornography and purity. Some some really awesome episodes with my co-hosts, getting really honest about those things. And tonight we have our fourth guest, one of my favorite people on the planet, Joe Campo. He's not only the founder and Grand Puba, it doesn't say that, but it encapsulates all that he is, the Grand Puba of Grassroots Films and an awesome project called St. Francis House, which he's been involved with for many years. We'll learn about that tonight. He's a very close brother uh, to uh, Father Benedict Rochelle at one point here on this earth and now in eternal life. So he brings that great uh, sonhood, if you will, to that wonderful priest and friend of ours, a good friend of mine in life and now uh, seeking his intercession. So Joe Campbell's with us tonight. We're going to be looking at some trailers from some powerful movies that he's produced and talking about the influence that they were in his life from a perspective of discovering what it means to be a godly man and trying to live that out. So that's a little bit of a showcase tonight. So back to Pentecost365.us. You'll see the image there in our very logo, Man Up. The U of the up is that turnaround sign you see in the road. And it implies what? That number one, where are we heading? Are we going in the right direction? Let's just keep it real. Most of us, parts of our souls, our affections are fixed on wrong things. And we need the grace to turn around. So we need the revelation to know where we're meant to be, to hear God's voice through revelation speak to us of that truth. But we need that additional thing called grace. We need his power to cause us to recognize where we go and that we turn around and focus on him, where we will discover our truest, greatest self. So that's that you image of the up. You also see the awesome campfire there. So hear the fire crackling and we want that experience. Men like to be outdoors. We like to be in the elements. And as it's getting beautiful, more and more we got to get out there following this coronavirus thing. I think if you're like us, you're just hungry to break out, right? Physically, spiritually, in every way. Does the church need to break out? We're on the veritable eve of Pentecost. 2,000 years ago, Luke 12, 49, Jesus said, he gave us his reason why he came. Listen to this. He said, I came to set the earth on fire. And how I wish it were already ablaze. That was 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit has already come and is pouring forth. Are we living in that promise and in the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, Pentecost is upon us after this season of COVID. And who knows what's going to happen in this world. But are you hungry to break out as I am? To trust in God like Peter in the boat. Maybe we've been comfortable, quarantined in the boat. But we see the Messiah coming to us on the water. It's a great image for us right now. Do we have that? desire in our hearts to get out of that boat and take those steps towards him, looking at him and realize the world depends upon it, brothers. The world depends upon us having that courage beyond our fears, beyond our doubts, beyond our awkwardness. Are you hungry for it? Is it the hunger that defines everything else in our lives to live for Jesus Christ fully, not just in a cliche way, but in a way that animates, captivates our deepest hearts? Well, I desire that. That's why I'm here, because I can't do it alone. We can do it together. That's what this program is all around, all about. And that's why we're surrounding kind of this image of being around this fire, hearing it crackling, being brothers, being candid, sharing the story, talking about some of the challenges and wanting to really keep it real. So hopefully you are with us, united in this yearning to more fully know who we are and to live it out at Pentecost365.us. So check that out. And now we're going to kind of introduce our hosts, Mike and Walt. We'll get to Joe very shortly here. But I want to introduce Mike and Walt. And so tell us a little bit about yourselves, guys. You've done this every week. But along with that, I'm going to ask you to share a man-up question, a man-up moment in your life where you had to be vulnerable and the difference that it made by being vulnerable and transparent. Let's start with Mike. Who are you, Mike? And a man, a moment where you had to be vulnerable and the difference it made. Hey, thanks, Greg. And nice to meet you, Joe. And always nice to see you, Walt. So my name is Mike Boscovich. I'm in Huron, Ohio, just uh, south of Toledo, maybe about an hour, very close to Cedar Point. 
uh, happily married for it'll be 24 years this summer. Uh, have eight beautiful children, five girls, three boys, and we also have six uh, that are up in heaven. So my wife and I have been uh, very close, dated for five years, and then and then got married. And uh, she's just been the love of my life, and and I'm a really happy Catholic uh, guy. Um, so let me just tell you about a quick vulnerable moment in my life, and, and it's I, I don't even like talking about it, but it's something I draw upon when I need strength. Uh, when my first year down in pharmacy school at Ohio State was really tough, I almost failed out. Uh, I was having tr uh, trouble adjusting, living off campus. The curriculum was extraordinarily hard, and I was getting lousy grades. And, uh, and I actually shared this story in the, in the past with Greg. I had to meet with the dean of students, and you don't want to be that guy having that meeting. Uh, I think I had failed uh, – biochemistry, organic chemistry class. And he said, you know, what's going on? And he kind of took me under his wing in his office. And we just had a man up discussion. Like, can you handle this? And I was asking myself, you know, a day or two before that meeting, this is really, I, I don't, this is my whole future. I don't know if this is, if I'm cut out, I'm good enough. And he kind of put his arm around me uh, and said, you are good enough. And uh, it was a real moment where he said, you know, let's keep it simple. I believe in you. And, um, Fast forward, I obviously graduated pharmacy school and ended up getting a, a, an award of uh, pharmacy leadership for the state of Ohio a few years ago. And he was sitting in the front row of the audience, downtown Columbus, in the convention center. I didn't even know he was going to be there. And I'm talking about this story. And I look right down, and I'm, I'm thinking my wife, I'm thinking other people that showed up. And I look right down there, and there he is, Dean Hale. And I couldn't believe it. And I, I almost, Teared up mm. uh, for him believing in me when I was a kid. And now I've uh, turned out into the man that I am and uh, really tough. And, and I use that story today to inspire others. I definitely use it with my own sons and daughters. Mm. And um, it, it really was a man up moment for, for me. That's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mike. Walt. Walt Erickson in Ottawa Lake, Michigan, right over the border from uh, Toledo, Ohio. And we've got six babies here on earth and one that we know of uh, in heaven. Um, been married for 16 years, very happily. <laughs> uh, and my, my man up moment, um, I think is a culmination of multiple conversations with my wife over the years. So uh, grew up very, very selfish, very mm -hmm. selfish. Um, and one become a spiritual leader in my home. Um, my wife and children proclaimed some years ago that I was a spiritual leader in my home. Um, but there's that doesn't that doesn't mean there weren't still battles. Um, and my wife and I had a very serious conversation a few years back, uh, really an all day conversation. The kids were not with us, and she said, "You know." You're, you're doing a great job leading the family. You're doing a great job leading a lot of people. She goes, but you are not dying to yourself. You're just not. You are putting yourself before me. And it hurts. And it's been going on for a very, very, very long. And uh, in my younger years, conversations like that, I would have just you know, dismissed. Wouldn't have yelled, wouldn't have screamed, right? I would have just walked away and ignored it. Instead, I knew she was right. I knew she was right. And um, it's like, I can deny it or I, you know, can I, I can deal with it. So we had a very long, detailed conversation, put a plan together, um, to help her keep me accountable um, with being, you know, more present. Uh, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm a weightlifter. I adjusted, I adjusted working out, uh, stopped playing sports outside the home, spend more time at home, you know, doing those types of things. It's still a battle, but uh, there were some victories after that and I, I can't thank her enough for loving me enough right to challenge me and to know that i would be accepting of the challenge that's awesome thanks so much mike and walt so mine Catherine is our second girl but the fourth child in our family um has been battling some very significant physical challenges in her life um and we have some wonderful doctors in the arena and she's dealt with it so gracefully she's grown God is really forging her truly to be a saint. But anyway, is it just, you know, challenged me. Why haven't I posted a prayer request? You know, this has been going on for months. Why haven't I 
on my own page, asked people to pray for her. So literally, I'm a little ashamed to admit that it's we pray over her. We've prayed over her. We've had friends know about this, but to post it, it use this medium to do that. So that's exactly what I did last week. Brothers and sisters who are listening on the airwaves and who see her beautiful picture here and are united in this prayer, I'm so humbled that after I post that less than a week ago, as you can see below her picture, yes, that's right, almost 700 people commented, or I should say reacted to it. And of that, 425 different comments, 425 different people passing along their prayers and blessings, 116 different shares. So uh, just extraordinarily moved at what God can do through means such as this to unite us. So yes, we ought to be concerned about digital media and we've been down on it in the past and there are reasons to be cautious, right? But where else do you get this kind of response to unite people in prayer for something that's very important like that? So back to our program here. We're blessed that you are with us with this Man Up awesome experience. Man Up with Greg, Mike, and Walt. You can Check it out uh, in the visual form at Pentecost365.us. Otherwise, we are over the radio. There you see Mike's family. There's Walt's family as uh, they just are two co-hosts. And uh, before we get back to Joe here in a moment, we're going to do a fun lightning round as we always do, kind of some softball questions. Um, We're going to go through uh, Psalm 1 very quickly here because we like these We used to call them info boards that kind of speak to us, right? In the past, we had some on porn and purity. We had some on uh, being a godly father, the stats if we're not in the game. Well, we're just going to simply focus here on the very first psalm, and I'll have Mike and Walt alternate in speaking to us. The words of David, really, his prayer speaking to us, but these words of wisdom from God to us who yearn to be godly men. So lay it on us, Mike and Walt. Go ahead. Seven marks of a godly man is uh, Greg... uh teed us up nicely from, from Psalms. His life is blessed. Blessed is the one. He keeps himself from evil. He does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. He has a love for God's truth. He is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. He lives a life of strength. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. Mm. He has a fruit-filled life. His life yields its fruit in season. God's favor is with him. He is the one whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And lastly, God watches over his way, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Pretty awesome guidance, brothers who are listening to us right now. And by the way, I always state this, women, you have permission to eavesdrop. We want you to hear the challenges and the battles we men are having and desiring to be godly men, husbands and fathers. And I encourage you to get your husbands and those men in your life attuned to this movement at Pentecost365.us, trying to keep it real in the journey. So I'm not going to, if I even if I had the power to canonize my brother Joe Campo here, not quite doing that yet, but he epitomizes this Psalm 1. He really uh, is a wonderful witness to me and to many in his life of pursuing these attributes of a godly man. And um, his life bears it out. And it obviously, he wasn't born into the world that way. We're going to get to his story very shortly here. God is continually to fo- continually forming him. But I really am so blessed to be united with him in this uh, mission field. So I formally want to welcome you here, Joe. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me on, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. And thank you, Mike. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. We got to start with a little bit of fun here, but because we know you're a thoughtful man, we have some thoughtful questions woven into this lightning round. What is a lightning round? We ask you some questions and you give us kind of like a quick 15, 20 second answer. So let's lay it on him. All right. So I get to go first. If someone visited you in Brooklyn, Joe, and you wanted them to give, if you want to give them a taste of what is distinctively Brooklyn, what restaurant would you have to take them to? I would have to take them to Carmine's. Actually, I've done that on quite a few different occasions. Nice Italian restaurant, the type of restaurant that has uh, wooden chairs and wooden tables with checkered tablecloths, family owned. Joe, I just got to, as a follow-up, do they have the, the, in the toilet in the back with the water and the, you know, (laughs) with the, where you can put a gun back there? (laughs) They redid the place. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) Next one, Walt. Uh, yeah, this is awesome. This, I'm entertained. I really am. Good. Uh, my wife and I just watched uh, Godfather, actually, like 
few weeks ago. It was like one of our two quarantine movies. <laughs> uh, favorite family vacation as a child? Tell me you left the state. We never really had family vacations. I come from a working class family where, where my, my dad worked two jobs to take care of his family. Mm. He was a real man. And my mom stayed home with us. Actually, I can only remember one time that we went out to a restaurant to eat dinner together. It was a Chinese restaurant, and it was on Mother's Day. That's the only time I think the whole wow. family ever went out to dinner. Wow, it's wow. amazing. Yeah. It's a story. So a little soft spot in my heart as you share that, but also knowing that God's hands weave us in our poverty, and as some of your movies bear, 95% of the planet has never experienced what we regard as a vacation, right? So, no, thanks for sharing that. If you don't mind sharing, what's a favorite mom memory? A favorite mom memory. That's great, Mike, because there's a lot of them, mm. actually. There's a lot of them. It's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to pick and choose, but I think maybe just for, for our conversation now. My mom was one of those Italian women, really, you know, salt of the earth, mm. you know, and had a tremendous amount of wisdom. And I remember one time, I, I, I grew up in Long Island, and it was a, uh, a you, it was called matzah pizza land. You were either Jewish or Catholic. That was it. <laughs> and so uh, a black family had moved in. And it's the first time that there was a black family moving into our town. There was kind of an uproar going on in the neighborhood. I did not grow up in a prejudiced family at all. And I remember my mom saying that you be very careful about what other people are saying about that family. God must have loved them very, very much because he made mm. so many of them. Don't you ever say anything negative. Mm. And so that's kind of like a mom memory. So we, we didn't grow up with any prejudice at all. That's you know? awesome. Everybody right across the board, you know. That's awesome. All right. So following that up, favorite dad memory. Favorite dad memory. You know, my dad didn't spend a lot of time with us because, like I said before, he worked a lot, but I remember uh, uh, one of my favorite was just him and I, and he took me outside and we played football probably for about one hour. There wasn't a lot of talking going on, but the fact that he would take me out of, I have three other brothers, it's four boys, take me out of the house and just give all his time just to me has probably helped me tremendously in forming other young men and how important that really is. So the favorite memory is playing football with my dad. And all we did was play catch. We didn't play mm -hmm. tackle. Awesome. You know, it's funny. And we've been talking about that last several weeks, just stealing 30 seconds with your son, five minutes with your daughter. And here, look at that impression that he's left with you. Awesome. Mike, I, I must have been about, at the most, 12 years old. Yeah. I will never forget it. It's, it's in my heart. It's, it, it left an indelible mark on my heart and it made me feel so special because i have three other brothers he could yeah. have done with all of us at the same time but he chose me and for some reason you know i i don't know what he was thinking you know but i'll never forget the time he threw that football straight up and i and i caught it and when he went like this when he when he gave me this gold. i was a man for the first time yeah. you know yeah <laughs> gold that's awesome okay yeah. well you know, it sounds like you probably like a lot of music. If you could keep music from just one artist, who would that be? Oh, that's an impossible question to ask. <laughs> but you're the one who can do it, Joe. Come no, on. Gregory, um, you know, I, I don't know if I can answer that question, Mike. I, it's Who's on the top of your head, Joe? Like, what, I, what just I, I comes love, out? I love all types of music, you know, and being a filmmaker and so forth and so on. Certain music takes me to certain places. I bet, man. Yeah, and I like to travel a lot in my mind and in my heart, you know? And so if I was to just, like, be home right here alone, and if I could blast something, it would probably be Carlos Santana. Oh, nice. Yeah, it'd probably be something that would be really, like, because, you know, Carlos Santana is one of the first Spanish guys who, he was the first Spanish guy who, who did like Spanish rock music, mm. you know, and he got it in. And a great man and a suffering man. Mm. I respect him tremendously. He had a 
terrible, terrible childhood. Mm. He rose above it. So he's also, besides having great music, when he plays, uh, you know it's him. I mean, let's just face it. We, we, you know, if you hear Santana in the background, you know it's him. So anyway, uh, I, I guess I would blast that right now if I could. Let's go with that. I love that. Carlos Santana, especially the Woodstock set. But I'm really glad you invoked the hallowed name of Carlos Santana. Now you got to get him to be a guest on our Man Up episode, Joe. That's uh, I'm going to Also, ask- you know, when he did a concert somewhere. I don't know where, exactly where it was, but he had a gigantic uh, poster of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Oh, wow. Father Benedict Rochelle Memory, your favorite one. One I'll never forget and one I pass on to other people. I do a lot of counseling with young men at the St. Francis mm. House. And uh, after my conversion experience in Medjugorje in 1988, I went to visit Father Benedict Rochelle. And after speaking to him and telling him my experience, he listened at- very intently to everything that I was saying. I really didn't even know who he was at the time. I was just sent to him by other friars as a courtesy. And so uh, after I explained to him what I was planning on doing, and the plan was to leave everything behind Mm. and just work for God, case closed. The advice that he gave me, he looked right at me and and, and, and he said, Joe, don't look back. And I looked at him. And it went right through me. He goes, listen to me. Don't look back. Awesome. And when he said that to me, because Gregory, you know, you spent a lot of time with Father. Mm -hmm. It went right through me. Mm. And our relationship began right there. My dad had already passed away. He became my father at that time. Not only spiritual director, but my father at that time. Mm. Want to know something? I took his advice and I give it all the time to young men. Don't look back. And it was a very masculine way of of uh of telling another man on how to live his life and be strong and kick ass if you have to (laughs) yeah no regrets (laughs) no regrets move let's go put your boots on and let's go extreme survival extreme survival yeah yeah i saw that before that's excellent i got up that i have that up there deliberately got the blessed mother in there because she conquers she kicks can Ephesians yep. 3, uh, Genesis 3.15. Anyways, Father Benedict Rochelle, thank you for sharing that. I got teared up a little bit hearing you speak of that, not only the wisdom, but you know he lived it solidly, so his words had mm-hmm. weight. This was not just whomever right. else's words you may hear or read about, but you knew it was a direct line to the way that he lives himself. He put his hand to the plow. He was about it. He never looked back. He suffered, endured a lot of suffering and persecution, rejection in his life. But why is it powerful, those words that he spoke to you and to me in my life? Because he was connected to God and he was all about it. Can mm. I give you one more quick yeah, absolutely. one? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, another one that he gave me was, don't second guess yourself. Mm. Make a decision and go with it. I mean, apply common sense, you know, <laughs> but, but don't second guess yourself. You're good at what you do. And most of us are, you know, we just doubt ourselves, you know, but the fact is, and Greg, you and I spoke about this a little bit earlier, you know, you want to get everything right. You, know, mm. you want to be a perfectionist. You want to do this. You want to do that. You want to get everything right. But it's true. You know, don't second guess yourself. You make the decision, you go with it and that's it. And then along the way, if you find that you have to make modifications, you make your modifications accordingly. We're getting a lot out of this lightning round. It's awesome. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm stoked. We got a few more left. Yeah, Mike. I love it. So, Joe, what's a little known fact about you that, you know, our audience could really learn from? A little known fact about me. Uh, I I would say that um, my devotion to the Holy Rosary, Mm. it's so important, Mike, as you know, but for our listeners, you know, save the whole world, you know, you know, it it can change the course of mighty rivers, you know, It, it, it. you know, with Our Lady, we can do anything, anything. And the rosary is the most powerful weapon that we have today. And every man should know how to use a weapon. Every uh, man should know how to protect. Every man has to man up. Every man has to step forward, you know. And 
I can only do that. My strength comes from that, mm. from praying the rosary. I just taught a young man who was a, uh, a guest at our house many, many years ago. He's in his mid-30s now and, and just taught him how to pray the rosary yesterday. Mm. You know? And uh, I, I think that if, if, uh, if more men knew that other men were praying the rosary, they might do it too. It's <laughs> totally, totally true. <laughs> It's awesome. Thank you. Well, <laughs> dramatic switch here, I guess, in direction. But if your friends heard you were in prison, what would they assume you did? They assume that I got arrested for uh, going to mass when we're not supposed to go. Or uh, maybe I got, you know, taken off uh, praying the rosary at the Margaret Sanger uh, building down in New York mm -hmm. City with the friars. Uh, at the abortion clinic that I, that I'm, I'm not leaving. Awesome. You want to carry me out, carry me out, yeah. you know, but I'm not leaving. I'm, uh, I'm protesting, you know, so I would be in jail for probably uh, one of those things. Awesome. And I'm thinking awesome. of going to mass. Mm. Awesome. Two okay. more. All right. Um, <clears throat> Joe, do you have a favorite non-liturgical prayer that you like to go to? Uh, any prayer, I think from the heart, Mm -hmm. it, it answers that, you know, um, I have a lot of those, you know, depending on my situation. Uh, I just may say, you, you know, I said it this morning when I got up because the sun was out. Thank you, Lord. What a, what a beautiful day you gave us. You know? What a, what a beautiful day. Let's, let's get outside and breathe. Mm -hmm. Let's let the sun hit us. You know, for me, that's a prayer because I'm talking to God, you know? Yeah. And so that goes on all day long. Sometimes mm -hmm. you might think I'm crazy. <laughs> that's great we've heard uh, uh a few beautiful pieces of advice that others have given you um what is a piece of advice made a huge different in difference in your life that you've not shared yet here's something i haven't shared yeah i'm glad you said medjugorje because it, it's a big help wall um i really have, have never shared some of the things that i've actually seen there with my own eyes that were miraculous and one of them that I'll give you is that I actually saw come out of the sun a Tau cross. When I came back, and this is one of the reasons I was talking to Father Benedict Michelle, go back to the other question. When I told him I saw a T, I didn't know. He was the one who explained to me what a Tau cross was. I had no idea. Turns out that this was on the Feast of St. Francis at the same time. Wow. And, wow. I didn't know, and I didn't know it was the Feast of St. Francis. There's a lot more, but for the sake of the show, I think that kind of explains it, Walt, I hope. Oh, man. As a Catholic body, you share with us this conviction that obviously we await what the church says as the apparitions continue. And I was there also and had a powerful experience. And it all points towards public revelation. It all, to me, accentuates what we hold true in the magisterium of the Catholic Church. It uh, fostered a deep relationship, uh, deeper in the Trinity and our Blessed Mother Mary leading us there. And I think we got to be attuned because a lot of uh, everything that what she's saying resonates with her apparitions throughout um, his, throughout history in the 20th century, pray from the heart, pray the rosary. Um, and obviously that heart of peace, which is fostered by this intimacy with God in heaven is so, so key. Anyways, Joe, um, we want to get to the movie trailers, uh, respectively, the human experience and outcasts, um, and just, uh, hear your thoughts about how they impacted you. And, uh, particularly from the standpoint of being a godly man. But before we do that, just, Trace for us a little bit of the Joe Campo backstory up to present day. How far you want to go back there, Greg? I don't think you want me to say it all started back in 19... No, give us like three minutes, just kind of trace it where you grew up and uh, your faith and really the main movements in your life up to present day that have brought you to be a convicted I mean, Catholic. I, like I mentioned earlier, Greg, I, I grew up in Long Island and I think I had a very special grace uh, my whole life. You know, like I said, there were four boys in the house. I was the only one who wanted to go to church. So God had given me that at a very early age. And uh, even when I met a girl in my teens, I, I thought it was best if I took her to church, you know, and, and my friends, you know, growing up in the 60s and the 70s were taking them to their bedroom. I, I just didn't think it was the right thing to do, you know, and so I didn't. And I, and I did. So I kind of like was an oddball. I really didn't fit in too many places, you know. A lot of people were going to bars and so forth. They're like, I would go to a bar and stuff like that. What am I doing here? This, this is nothing. I didn't fit anywhere. I didn't fit anywhere in life. Actually, I'm the third child out of four. You don't want to be number three out of four because 
Number one is number one. Number two is right after. Number three is like, eh, and then there's the baby is born. So where is number three? <laughs> I'm number three, too. You know what it's like, you know? But I wouldn't change a thing. Mike, I wouldn't change a thing. It yeah. made me who I am today. It made me strong. But I always had this faith in God. And then, of course, the 70s came around and so forth and went off the trail, you know, just went mm -hmm. totally off the trail. Always believed in God. Don't get me wrong. That, I mean, that never really left me. I was never like an atheist or anything, but went off the rails like, like anybody else in those days, you know, and it wasn't pretty, <laughs> you know, made a lot of mistakes, did a lot of things that I shouldn't have done, went along with the crowd. I, I never, you know, things like, uh, things like that. I, I tell people today is like, you know, be a leader, not a follower, mm -hmm. you know, and I saw myself being a follower in some of these things. But when, you, when, you, when you're living in the world and you're thinking that money is going to uh, be the thing that's going to satisfy you or make you happy or you're going to meet the most beautiful woman because you have the nicest car, you know, uh, boy, everything that, that, that uh, I was taught through the media and so forth was just nothing but a big fat lie. What a bunch of yeah. BS, you know? And then finally, after my conversion experience, I have to tell you, I'm a divorced man, okay? Because I, I was married for like almost, almost 10 years. And then it was a terrible time in my life when I went through that. You know, one side of my brain was like totally mm. depressed. And then the other side of my brain was like, hallelujah. Mm. Made no sense. Made no sense. But I was sort of, Father Benedict said, I was sort of given my wings. Now you can fly and do what you were really created to do. Mm. I have two boys of my own and four grandchildren. Uh, and, and so, uh, but after my, con I'm going to take it, Greg, right to my conversion experience. After oh, I realized that everything that I was doing was wrong. I mean, I wasn't a, a guy that, you know, needed to be in jail or something like that. But the way I was living my life, it was all wrong. Everything that I was taught was wrong. You know, I played in a band. I'm a musician. Uh, you know, I went down all the wrong roads and so forth. Uh, I thought being a rock star would be the, the way to conquer the world, you know. Once to conquer the world, after you get older, you realize it's a pretty big, pretty big place, you know, and it's just me, you know. But anyway, after my conversion experience, Our Lady had showed me what was real. She also told me, not in an audible voice, that everything I learned about the Catholic Church was true. So that made me wrong. I didn't think I had to go to confession, guys. I didn't think it was necessary. What a mistake. I didn't think I had to receive the Eucharist. I didn't even know what the Eucharist was. I wasn't taught properly in Catholic school. I had to, I had to go out and learn it myself after my conversion experience. Mm -hmm. Most of it was actually given to me through the friars and through friends I had met at the time. God placed me on the right road. Uh, there's many roads out there that any one of us can take, you know, and God says, there it is. Pick one, you know. And, and so I was fortunate enough to have the grace to meet along the friars, meet with the friars and meet with Father Benedict and so forth. And they, not only did they put me on the right road, but they kept me on the right road, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Sometimes we need that too. Mm -hmm. you know? Since I knew at this time in my life, I didn't have all the answers. I knew there was a God and I wasn't him. And I'm just me. And if, I, and, and if Jesus Christ didn't do what he did, I'd go to hell. I knew that. You know, there's nothing any one of us could do. You know, it's all a gift. It, it, it's all a gift. So it was that gift was given to me. And then when I realized that when it became a reality in my life after my conversion experience, I became a very grateful person because I really haven't done anything to deserve it. And here's another thing is that um, it's open to all of us. It's open to all of us. All we have to do is say yes. Of course, I had a conversion experience in like one minute. It's like Our Lady hit me over the head with a two by four, but you know I'm from New York. You know, <laughs> didn't didn't mo most people spend you know 20 years having a conversion experience? <laughs> Done. <laughs> Thank God. You know, got exactly what I need. Greg, does that answer the question? That's before? awesome. <laughs> That's great. No looking back. So no looking back. Amen. We'll, we'll get to the film stuff um, through the Saint Francis home. You just give us a snapshot of that and and how it got you into filmmaking. Just give us the primer on that, and then we're going to get to the human experience. You know, something I always wanted to do was make films, Greg. I don't know if you know that. Mm -hmm. 
always had it in my in my heart. And I was the type of guy even growing up when I was watching a movie, no matter what it was, um, I was looking at the camera angles. And you know, I could never sit down and really watch a movie like normal people. I'm listening to the music. I always wanted to do it. And, and The Godfather is a movie that I watch at least once a year, just so you know, Walt. It's a, it's a, it's a movie about the family. It's really not about the mafia. So, I mean, I always thought it was a great movie just because of the underlying premise, if you will. They're doing business. You know? So anyway, and I'm Italian, but let me tell you something. Even I tell the boys at the St. Francis house, those are the worst people in the world. Mm. You got to pray for those people. Mm. They, they just make them look good, but they're not good. You know? Mm. Okay. So, um, I had a young man move into the house, Greg, who was uh, wanted to become a filmmaker. And uh, I looked at his films. And um, one of the things I do anytime somebody moves in the house is I ask them what their aspirations are, what do they want to become, uh, what kind of man do you want to be in the world? You know. And this young man said uh, he wanted to be a filmmaker. I said, show me your films. He showed me his films. They weren't good. They were great. Mm. Big difference. He could tell a story. And I said, hey, you want to make films? Let's make films together. We'll get everybody involved in the house. And we'll make films together. And we made a film called The St. Francis House. And um, this was many, many years ago, 20 years ago. And uh, we raised a ton of money. And I, I, I didn't even realize that we were going to do that. But we did. Because our house runs on donations. So I figured, let me do something that can bring in some revenue. And sure enough. We raised like $50,000. I gave the money to Father Benedict. And he goes, what's this? I said, I raised this through the St. Francis house. And he says, well, what are you giving it to me for? I said, because I'm just the director. It's your house. Mm. This is the money that came through the house. Mm. I didn't even have an, an account at that time. He had the account. I said, yeah, put it in the account. He goes, well, what do you want to do with it? I said, what do I want to do with it? I can spend that money. There's no problem about spending <laughs> money. I said, well, I, I want to open up a film company. Mm. He said, you want to open up a film company? He goes, who's going to watch your films? I said, everybody's going to watch our films. They're going to be good. And he just looked at me. He gave me the money. He goes, all right, <laughs> go ahead. You know, and we did. And from that movie, the, the next thing that we did was um, the one that people might recognize. It's kind of old now is, is the human experience. Mm. And it did very, very well in the secular world. Awesome. So Folks, you are tuned in or watching now live Man Up with Mike, Walt, and Greg. It's a fourth episode. We're very blessed to have Joe Campo with us. You can find this at Pentecost365.us. And really, it's emerging as more than just, you know, if you will, a program but, or a, a moment, but a way of life, a movement, really. Uh, we want to invite men to identify what is it that defines us. You know, what are those fundamentals to receive the grace? God is pouring out grace in our lives. Are we, you know, putting the flag in the sand in those fundamental moments to receive that grace? You can find out more at Pentecost365.us and these episodes. So Joe Campo is our guest. He's a filmmaker. He shared his backstory very candidly, just very moved by your story, Joe, and uh, that journey. And I know there's so much more to it. But the heart of it is we are fallen. We are lost. We are nothing without Jesus Christ. He made us for himself. Comes across really clear in Joe's story. And uh, he had many things handed to him. Uh, wealth, popularity, all of those things were in his culture. He maybe tasted of them to some extent and came to an awareness that we are nothing without Jesus. He makes it available to all of us. And uh, even in this moment, it's being worked out, whether we've you know, accepted Jesus and we're in the faith and praying the rosary and going to mass, there's so much more. There's a horizon of greater depth that we can walk in and experience and live that more fully. So we're going to watch this trailer now from The Human Experience. Every human being who thinks about is looking for meaning. They're looking for answers to the most elementary questions. Who am I? How did I get here? What am I supposed to do? Does it finally make any difference?
breathtaking reality, a new, unrepeatable, unprecedented adventure of a human life. Just, I'm amazed. I've seen that film. I was blessed to be at one of the premieres, Joe, in New York and see Father Benedict when he was living in a, just that one of many auditoriums that you've showcased this throughout the country, even seeing just that trailer again. I got to hold back tears, man. I just, you know, you just nailed it. It's just, it's timeless. Uh, just before, I just want you to tell us where folks can see that and Outcast. Let's get that out there and we will again later. Quick comments just by seeing the trailer from Mike and Walt and then I want to get to you, Joe. So, Joe, where can people watch that movie and Outcasts? Yeah, actually, it's uh, it was on Netflix for the longest time. It's off Netflix now. But if anybody really wants to get it, I can I can send them a copy on okay. DVD. So, folks, call me or contact me, uh, greg at massimpact.us. Greg at massimpact.us if you'd like to see that film. We'll find a way to connect you with it. And Outcast, which just, I know we'll announce it again later, but where can they see Outcast, Joe? The latest Outcast, film. Outcast, you can uh, you can stream that on Stream Pro. Streampro.com uh, slash Outcast backslash. Okay. And again, folks, if you don't know where that is, if it went too quickly, um, contact me again. Greg at MassImpact.us. Just quick impressions, Mike Walt, on just seeing the trailer. Man, they're, they're very moving images. Hey, Dominic, you I need to be quiet, certainly please. certainly have that gift, Joe, uh, that you talked about and, and maybe with Father Groeschel. You know, I don't have a Father Groeschel story. I followed him for years in e- EWTN. I remember him always talking so patiently, softly, with a lot of conviction. As Greg said, he had a lot of weight in what he said. And I remember him, he would do a toast uh, at the end of the year with like a little a little uh, shot of sherry. And, and he was just so passionate. And I just got to tell you, when I hear you talk and when I see your work in those films, I feel Father Grishel's presence. And that's a testament to the years that you've, you've suffered with him and worked with him. I just really appreciate uh, all you do, and I can't wait to see these movies. When you see a movie like that that seems so right and so beautiful in God's eyes, you just you know that we we didn't you didn't come with yourself. You were told what to do, weren't you? You were told what to make. You were told how to make it. You were told where to go, who to see. You know the people that came to you were that were who who Christ wanted people to see come to you. Um, I would like to see that movie bad. Mm. Greg, I, I really, really, really want to see that movie. Very moving. Please get it out. Absolutely. Um, let's go to you, Joe. With the time that we have, it just we've, we've, it's already been so rich without even getting to these, but prominent from your vantage as the producer, director behind this powerful movie, just prominent themes maybe that touched you and emphasized, particularly the call to be a godly father, a godly man. Let, let me just say that the human experience is a pro-life film that never mentions pro-life, never mentions abortion, never mentions Catholic, just this, because life is so precious. Hey, guys, and can so you please keep it down? I can pick you exactly up. That's exactly what you know, I, I'm trying to do in all of my films, is, is to tell you how beautiful life is. And in order for you to discover how beautiful life is, sometimes you just got to have to suffer. Whether it's your suffering or somebody else's suffering, it's a part of life. It's a part of growth. This is what it's how we suffer. It's not the suffering 
It's how we suck, you know? And so I've shown both sides, in all of my films, I've shown both sides. I've shown the suffering. I show you how we come out of it. And, I, and I, hopefully, you know, the, the ending is, is a positive ending, you know? Um, there's always a crescendo at, at the end of the film. And there's a crescendo at the end of our life. And I kind of see it that way, that a film, you know, and life, you know, art imitates life. Life imitates art. So I'm hoping that people will see this and, and sort of just, you know, maybe if they have to make a change in their life, if they have to forgive someone, do it. You know, I, I, I can, when I, you know, my work at the St. Francis House makes me always think of that Jesus is going to say at the end, you know, just, just like uh, the prodigal son, look, I don't care what you've done. Just get home, you know, like any father would say to his child, you know, there's nothing a child can do that you can't forgive them for, you know, and it's just that simple. I don't care what you've done. Just get home. I've done that so many times at the St. Francis house with these young men who have done, even if I got to go pick up somebody in jail, you know, they're so embarrassed. I don't care what you've done. Just get home. Just get home because you want to protect them. You want to teach them. You want to show them what's right. They're going to make mistakes. I know I've made plenty. You know, one of the things that happens to me sometimes is if I have to admonish someone, honestly, I think this is a gift. The first thing I see is my own sins. Mm. Like before I go in there and like hit this guy because he deserves it. So do I. Mm. And you really come down to it, you know, and I think of my own sinfulness and how I want Jesus to treat me, you know, and sometimes Jesus is going to be strong with me. You know, just like I got hit over the head with a two by four for my conversion experience happened in 30 seconds, you know, not 30 years, 30 seconds. That's a lot to take, you know, but I really believe that that's what Jesus is going to say to us. Just come home, you know, then we'll take care of it. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Folks, again, you're tuned in with us. Man Up with Greg, Mike, and Walt, Pentecost365.us. And we're with Joe Campbell with Grassroots Films, St. Francis House. Just shared the trailer of one of the many majestic, powerful films that capture human experience. So by that title, The Human Experience, amazing portrait of young men who are really at at that age with many men right now, but even those of us who are older, on the journey of self-discovery. And uh, the film puts them into experiences around the world where they encounter difficulty, challenge, suffering, which strips us of the artificiality. I don't know how else to put it. That was my experience. In their shoes, we are brought into these circumstances where we are stripped of our pretenses, of our artificiality, of the stupidity that we focus on and we think are so important. Well, the film has a way of, of bringing us into those places where you encounter yourself as you truly are in that fundamental, simple essence, the way God made us to be. And there's a freedom, there's a liberation there. That's my kind of take on this film and why you need to see it, the human experience. Maybe we'll connect with Joe and have maybe a national screening here online and he can share with us after seeing this film. In fact, I'm gonna throw this out there. If you men and your wives are interested in doing that, shoot me a note. If you would, uh, you know, line up with that, if we had a screening a couple weeks from now online and you could see it here and uh, be blessed by Joe's words, maybe some of the young men who are part of the uh, the experience, that could be a powerful thing. I'd like that. If that appeals to you, let me know. Greg at MassImpact.us. So we're going to go to the second with a limited time that we have here. We're going to go to the second outcast, which just came out. So let's give this a watch. I'm sorry. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. 
Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world. Millions of despairing men, women and children. Don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke, it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man, nor a group of men, but in all men. I get goosebumps. I can barely speak. And again, for those of you who are just listening to this on Catholic radio or radio throughout the world, you can see the images at Pentecost365.us. I can't say strongly enough to take the two and a half, three minutes that that trailer is. Go to YouTube. Everybody can access that. Look up Outcasts movie. You'll find it in the search. Look for HD. I think there are some variations that aren't HD. Maybe most of them are HD. Watch it in HD. Set it for HD. The filmography, the storyline, the Eucharist in the midst of that, the friars of the renewal throughout the world, the devastation, the suffering, the challenging. And these men of God who said yes to being a godly man and going into that and bringing the love, the tenderness, the affection, the compassion. Uh, I, I grew up a significant part of my life, I should say, was a time of discernment and spending with them, with Father Benedict Rochelle, living um, with them in New York. And uh, some of those places, at least in New York, in the prayer life, captured my soul um, with the heart of St. Francis, who had that defining moment, right, where he was living in wealth. He had everything handed to him. And many look at that and say, why would he give everything up before the bishop and all these people? And that's the language we'd use, right? Why would he give up the wealth and his clothes and walk away naked? You know, what's going on with that? From the vantage of God's eyes and what is true, he didn't give up. He gained. He saw the good and he saw the true and he went after it with his whole heart. He lived freedom. He lived wealth. And uh, I think that's what captures the heart of the Friars of the Renewal. That's what captures the heart of our brother here, Joe, in his movie making and telling this story. Uh, in the short time we have here, Joe, just some few punctual, uh, maybe um, what captured you most in producing that and seeing that film that's relevant, particularly to us as men. Yeah, that was a that was a very difficult film to make because we found ourselves in in danger a lot, you know, but it seems like every film that I make, I wind up in danger. You know, I mean, if I had it my way, I'd be making comedies right now, but I'm not being called to that. <laughs> I got a whole book of comedies. Nobody's laughing but me anyway. <laughs> These films touch the heart. And um, if you want to see it, you can go to streampro.com backslash outcasts, streampro.com backslash outcasts, and you can download it. This film is really not about the Franciscan friars as much as it is about the outcasts. Otherwise, I would have named it Franciscan friars, you know, but it's, it's really about the outcast in society. And God loved the outcasts in society. He was one himself. He became Jesus became one himself. And so it's really the film is about hope. You know, when you go through the trailer and you see all these terrible things that are going on, the film is about hope. The underlying premise is hope. You come out of this film, hopefully feeling good. Same thing with the human experience, feeling good. But in order to get to that point, we've got to, we've got to really, you know, go through reality. We've, 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 we've got to suffer. We are going to suffer in this life. And the world is teaching us how bad suffering is. No one wants to suffer. But again, it's how we suffer. When you see these people, these outcasts suffer, you will not believe the strength and the courage and how convicted they are to our Lord. The Franciscan Friars of the Renewal do not preach in this film. You never hear them say one prayer. You see them in silence praying, but you never hear it. The only people who preach in this film are the outcasts. Mm. Wow. So it's, it's something to see. Because when they say it, you expect a, a friar to uh, preach. 
But when, when a person who's, you know, shooting heroin says it, no, it takes on a whole nother meaning of suffering and hope. You know, Joe, you had talked about your life and thank you for sharing, you know, how you felt like an oddball and you felt like the media lied to you. And look how you've pivoted and, you know, men and our and images are so strong with us. You know, what do we need? What's God calling us to do? You've given us a media that we can believe in. And Greg, this is what Greg's mission and, and, and his uh, calling is as well. This medium where we could all coalesce around your film and talk as men. And, you know, we need those guardrails as you've outlined, you know, those, those kids that you just want them home. Like they just need the guardrails. And I, and I really applaud the effort because while uh, the images and, and the trailer really speaks to us, it, I think that's what kids and that's what men need today. Images that they can believe in, which is the truth and the way. And you've laid that out very nicely. Mike, one of the things I like to do, you know, at the St. Francis house, it's, it's a house for young men who need a second chance in life. Yeah. I've been here 30 years. The house has been here 50 years. But something like the Catholic Church, we've never changed. Yes or no, right or wrong. Kids want simplicity. They don't need the whole story. They are the whole story. You know what I'm saying? They themselves, their whole, we, they, they, they already know all that. Yes or no. Pick one. Pick one. And boy, you better pick the right one. Mm. And you know, when you give them that little bit of pressure, they can take it. There's not one young man in this house hasn't got a smack in the back of the head. It's an Italian love tap. (laughs) Hopefully something by being united with us in this episode stirs within us a desire to be united with others who want to start taking territory. Maybe we've lost or we've been, you know, on the sidelines and we've been letting things be taken from us personally in our marriages and our families. God equips us through the sacraments to be territory takers And it takes a context of brothers to say, this is our goal. This is our vision. We're not meant simply to be passive. We'd run into a burning building across the street with people we barely even know to save them physically, right? Of course we would. Well, that's heroic. Let's let's name it what it is. How about in our own homes with those we know breaking into the burning building that may be the relationships in our homes and creating a context of talking and praying? You can find out more about that at ilovemyfamily.us. So blessed to have you guys all with us. We look forward to next time. God bless you.